Today we are going to talk about some simple principles and use of Doppler flow velocimetry in obstetrics. To briefly review, um, the Doppler principle basically states that there is a frequency shift in sound when it is reflected back to its source from an object moving relative to its source. That object has some velocity and the sound shift, the frequency shift, is going to be proportional to the flow velocity. If one looks at this over time, one can generate a Doppler sonogram. as you look at velocity changes over time. Again, the Doppler shift frequency is proportional to the flow velocity. And the ratio of two Doppler shift frequencies under similar conditions is independent of the angle of interrogation of the particular moving object. In obstetrics, the moving objects we interrogate are blood cells moving in blood vessels. The results of this can give us information regarding both impedance and direction of flow as well as actual velocity of flow under certain conditions we'll talk about in a bit. The simple ratio of two Doppler shift frequencies is basically irrelevant under similar conditions, eliminating the need for a particular angle of interrogation. When we analyze waveforms, as in the case above, and in a blood vessel, we frequently look at peak systolic velocities and end diastolic velocities. Simple ratios of these values give us information as well as more complicated semi-quantitative analyses under certain conditions. When one actually wants to obtain something close to the real velocity of blood cells moving in a blood vessel. The angle of interrogation needs to be as close as head-on to possible. In other words, as close to a zero degree angle with the blood vessel. I can give you some hints for obtaining an optimum Doppler waveform. One is to try to keep this angle between zero and 30 degrees. Two is to position the transducer the shortest distance to the clear image of the vessel that's being interrogated. Three, one should set the gate of the transducer to the width of the vessel itself so that you can capture the entire cross-sectional area of the vessel, but avoiding overlap with adjacent vessels. One should also try to avoid compression of the blood vessel when one is interrogating. The major blood vessels we look at in a fetus and a mother during pregnancy are one, the umbilical artery, Two, the maternal uterine artery. Three, the middle cerebral artery. Four, the ductus venosus. Interrogation of each of these vessels can give us different information with regard to the health of a baby. The first two are useful in evaluating the, no the normality of placentation. The third, the interrogation of the middle cerebral artery, is useful in assessing blood flow redistrib redistribution in a baby, as may be seen with intrauterine growth restriction. And the fourth, interrogation of the ductus venosus, is very useful for determining the risk of the fetus for fetal cardiac decompensation under various conditions. It should be noted that the middle cerebral artery is also the vessel that's interrogated when we want to assess the degree of fetal anemia in a baby who has been exposed to parvovirus infection, a fetal maternal hemorrhage, and most frequently to maternal isoimmunization against RH and other non-RH antigens. If one looks at the umbilical artery, over time, 
the waveform looks as that depicted earlier in this program. Here again a peak systolic velocity and here an end diastolic velocity. Notice that this under normal circumstances should always be above a baseline. In other words, blood should always be flowing to the placenta from the baby in the uterine arteries. The placenta is like a sponge under normal circumstances. Early in pregnancy, the waveform may actually show very little diastolic velocity in the end. But invariably in normal pregnancies, this begins to look more like the diagram here the closer we get to term and the later we are in gestation. Indeed, by about 24 to 26 weeks gestation, the ratio of the peak systolic velocity to the end diastolic velocity under most circumstances is less than 3.0. Under pathologic conditions, the umbilical artery waveform can take on various forms. There can simply be very high resistance as depicted by again the ratio of the peak systolic to the end diastolic velocity. There may be actually absent end diastolic flow with a fall of the end diastolic velocity to zero or under the most severe conditions one might actually see reversal of end diastolic flow. In other words, while the heart is resting, blood is actually going back from the placenta to the baby. When we see these kinds of abnormalities, the major concerns are that there has been an abnormality of placentation to cause increased resistance pattern. This can come from poor invasion of the spiral arterioles early in pregnancy. It can be accompanied by decrease in the caliber and branching of the maternal and placental vessels feeding the placenta. And it can be associated with a decreased number of muscular arteries in the tertiary villi. Most commonly, this is associated with conditions of intrauterine growth restriction that can result in the end in small babies, preterm delivery, preeclampsia, and placental insufficiency that ultimately increases the risk for cesarean sections and very early deliveries. The important thing about the changes we see in the umbilical artery, for example, is that they precede changes in the gross fetal anatomical evaluation or biophysical uh, parameters that we use to evaluate the baby. The most severe form of these abnormalities with reversed end diastolic flow have been in the past associated with a fetal demise within brief periods of time, stillbirth, neonatal deaths, but also short and long-term morbidity that frequently results from intracranial problems associated with redistribution of fetal blood to help preserve essential organs in the baby. Uterine artery dopplers are very simple to obtain as well. Resistance in the uterine arteries usually drops throughout pregnancy until about 20 weeks. It drops very quickly during the first trimester of the pregnancy. A normal uterine artery waveform tends to take a configuration very similar to that of the umbilical artery, but where there is very low resistance to end diastolic flow. Abnormal waveforms can be associated with increased resistance patterns, just like in the, uter in the umbilical artery, or increased resistance patterns that are associated with something called notching, as demonstrated here. Uterine artery Doppler are important means of evaluating resistance 
of maternal blood flow into the placenta. And the pathologic consequences of abnormalities here are associated with many, if not the same, features we see with abnormalities of umbilical artery blood flow. An increased risk for pregnancy-induced hypertensive conditions, intrauterine growth restriction, premature delivery, fetal distress, and the need for operative deliveries.